Uh, so this talk is going to be an introduction to Spire, Spiffy, and how they're used in Istio, and we're going to look at a few different deployment architectures. Uh, it's mostly going to be introductory content, so we don't assume you know anything about Spire or Spiffy or Istio. That any better? Awesome, thanks. Um, so this is mostly going to be an introductory talk. <laughs> Not about Cloudera. Um, we're going to be talking about Spire, Spiffy, Istio, and how they kind of interact with each other, how they're different from each other, and some of the benefits of using one or the other. Real quick introduction, so my name is Shane O'Donnell. I'm currently a tech lead uh, on the GlueMesh team here at Solo. I've got about 10 years experience, and the last two and a half of those have been here at Solo. Uh, so the agenda, we're roughly going to just walk through what is Spire, and that kind of necessar necessarily talks about what is Spiffy, how does it relate to Spire. And we're going to dig into a little bit how they work, kind of walk through how the various different components are bootstrapped, how we establish identity in a, for a specific workload. And then we're going to talk more specifically about how all that works with Istio, what are some of the benefits of using the default implementation versus Spire, as well as uh, looking at how some of this works when you start getting some non-standard kind of heterogeneous deployment patterns. So first, uh, what is Spire? Um, the first thing you're going to find if you start Googling about what is Spire is the word Spiffy. They're pretty much intertwined. Um, Spiffy is essentially the open source standard for that you can use for securely kind of identifying all of your software systems, where Spire is a production-ready open source implementation of that standard. So Spiffy is the framework, the standard. Spire is the concrete implementation. Um, so with that, let's talk a bit about what is Spiffy, uh, what are the benefits of it, why do we want to use it. Um, so first of all, it's an acronym. It stands for uh, Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. And it's primarily concerned with bootstrapping and issuing identity to services that are across heterogeneous environments and org boundaries. And the heterogeneous environments bit is really important here. We're going to dig into this a little bit more in this talk. But essentially, it doesn't matter if your workloads are running on VMs, if they're running on premises, if they're running in the cloud. Uh, this should technically kind of be one answer for all of those different various platforms. Uh, it's also very specifically designed for dynamic environments. So you know, these days, especially with all the kind of scale that larger companies are running with with large workloads, minute by minute, the amount of workloads that have to kind of associate with any given identity can scale up and scale down. So we need a system that's able to react to that in real time. Uh, and then once you've implemented something that you know uses the Spiffy standard, all your workloads should be able to easily and reliably and securely mutually authenticate with each other. So you get that zero trust, really kind of concrete promise. And then from a user perspective, like why, why I want to use this is as a developer, you know, we're, st we're kind of starting to see ourselves getting pulled further up the stack more into the ops side of things. It's not just writing the applications anymore. It's understanding how they work, what other applications they talk to, what some of the platforms they run on look like. And then from the other side, from the ops team's perspective, we're talking about, you know, instead of just this IP address needs to talk to this IP address, they're starting to get more and more visibility into the apps that they're running. So, you know, it's the product page service needs to talk to the shopping cart service and things like that. So given all that, how does this work? Uh, first, I'm going to just kind of walk through a couple different primitives that I'm going to be using for the rest of the talk. So the first one is a workload. Uh, a workload is essentially just going to be any service or running workload which needs to have a unique, specific identity. Um, and some of the attributes and properties of this is that it can have a custom granularity. It can be a single process running on a node, but it's also elastic. So it could be multiple processes running across multiple loads. So you think of like a web server that's going to scale as your traffic spikes and, and wanes. Um, and interestingly, you know, a workload can have multiple IP addresses because it doesn't, it's not guaranteed to run on any given node. Uh, again, it's platform agnostic. We're not assuming you're running on Kubernetes here. We're not assuming you're running in any particular cloud. This could just be running on a VM on-prem if you wanted. Uh, and then finally, workloads are isolated so that if you had a malicious workload, it shouldn't have the ability to just steal the identity of any of the other workloads that are running on the same node. Uh, interestingly, the Spiffy standard doesn't actually like specify a way to do that. It just says, you know, whatever you do as an implementer, you need to make sure that that's true. Uh, so that brings us on to kind of three core concepts that Spiffy really kind of walks through. And th these are the things you really need to implement in order to have the, the Spiffy API, API. The first one is Spiffy ID. So this is essentially just the string that's going to identify the workload specifically and uniquely. And I don't know if you guys can see this on the slide, but down here on the bottom left, this is just an example of it. So even if you've never touched Spiffy or Spire, but if you've used Istio and you've used some of the uh, authentication policies, you might have seen this as a client ID. But all it really is is a trust domain and then a unique identifier for a workload ID. 
Uh, in Istio's example, which we're going to get into in a bit more detail in a second, it's always going to be by namespace and service account, but that's an Istio implementation detail. Not uh, Spiffy isn't that specific. Workload ID can be a bit more flexible. Uh, the next piece that's really important is the Spiffy verifiable identity document, or SVID. And you can kind of think of this one more like a passport. So like a passport, it has a couple of properties that are really important. You need to be able to verify its authenticity, like this is a real um, issue. It, the person who's holding it got it from where it says it comes from. And then you need to also verify that the holder is who they say they are. So those are two really important uh, properties that we need. Uh, in, in the context of SVIDs, it's guaranteed by um, cryptographically verifiable documents. Currently, the Spiffy standard allows you to do two different ones. So you can do JWT tokens, or you can do X509 certs. Uh, for most of this, we're going to be concentrating on the X509 certs, just because it's kind of the, the more commonly used one. And it isn't as vulnerable to some things like token replay attacks and things like that. Uh, and then finally, the workload API itself. So this is just the API which a given workload calls in order to get all of the information it needs to kind of participate in the specific system. Um, so interestingly, workload API is usually exposed locally, commonly over like a Linux, Linux um, socket. It's uh, interestingly, you don't need to have any kind of authentication to call it. The workload doesn't need to know anything about itself. It just says, hey, tell me who I am. And then what it gets back is it's going to get a spiffy ID so it knows who it is. It's going to get an SVID, which is, again, this cryptographically verifiable document that it can present to other workloads to prove it is who it says it is. And then it's also going to get the trust bundle, which it can use to verify other callers when they give it an SVID. It uses it to mutually authenticate the other way. Um, when we're talking about what this actually looks like deployed in an environment, uh, you're going to have these workloads, which are your actual services that you need identities for. You're going to have the Spire agent, and you're going to need one of those on every single node that you're running on. Um, what a node means is going to depend on what your deployment architecture looks like, but if we're just thinking of Kubernetes, it's literally just a Kubernetes node. Um, and then a Spire server is the kind of central authority that manages all of the identities and handles the registry of all of the workloads that you're allowed to issue identities for. So we're going to talk about um, exactly how this lifecycle works. Uh, apologies, I did have a few animations on this, but I converted it to PDF at the last second, so it's all coming at you really fast at once. But uh, essentially, when we're bootstrapping this environment, we're going to start by booting up the uh, Spiffy, uh, sorry, the Spire server. Uh, then, assuming you haven't given it a, a uh, root CA, you're going to it's going to generate a self-signed certificate. Then it's going to if, if it's the first time that this uh, particular server is starting up, it's going to generate a uh, root uh, trust bundle. At this point, the server is basically bootstrapped, so it's going to start that registration API, which um, can be called in order to register new workloads, and we'll get into that in a second. And at that point, the Spire server is pretty much ready to start receiving traffic. So we can go ahead and start up our agents. Um, and the first thing the agent's going to do is it's going to perform node attestation, which is basically just a fancy way of saying it's going to verify all of the properties of itself uh, specific to the node that it's working on. And I have another diagram which did use a bunch of animation, but we can just talk through this. There'll be a lot of pointing. Uh, but essentially, uh, you've got here on the left the blue Spire agent. And on the right, we've got the Spire server. And then we've got some kind of Oops, sorry, some kind of a platform-specific validation mechanism. Um, and this is basically just a third-party API that the Spiffy spec kind of implicitly trusts in order to verify the identities. Uh, if it helps to kind of think of this in more concrete terms, you could think an example of this would be like an, an AWS API. Uh, so the first thing that's going to happen is your Spire agent is going to, uh, when it boots up, it's going to call that and basically say, tell me everything about the node I'm running on. Give me um, verifiable documents that, so I can prove who I am. It's going to send those from the agent to the server. The server is going to verify independently, then call AWS or whatever your platform specific um, validation mechanism is and double check that everything looks good. And assuming everything checks out, then the Spire server issues the agent's identity to itself in the form of, of an SVID. Um, so your agent's going to have an X509 cert. It can prove it is who it says it is. And it's pretty much ready to go on to the next step. Um, next step is the agent actually boot starts bootstrapping itself. So it's got its own identity. It's ready to go. First thing it's going to do is call the Spire server. Um, when it calls it, the first thing it's going to ask for is a list of registration entries that this particular node that this agent is running on is authorized to issue um, workload identities for. And in order to establish that connection, it's done over um, mutual TLS, so both sides authenticate each other. The server is able to authenticate the agent using that SVID that it just issued it in the previous step. And then the agent is able to authenticate the server using the trust bundle it received in the previous step as well. So all of this is, is MTLS the whole way from here on. Um, next, assuming the, the handshake went well, uh, the Spire server is going to go to that registry. 
find all of those authorized registration entities from its data source that this agent is, is authorized to issue. It's going to send them back uh, basically as a list of registration entries to the agent. And then the agent, for each entry, basically the agent's going to send a CSR or a certificate signing request to the server. And the server's going to just stamp each of them, send them back, and then at that point, the agent's going to have a list of workload SVIDs. And these are basically the identity documents that each, each individual workload can use in order to um, guarantee that it is who it says it is. Um, but of course, at this point, they're all just in the agent. We haven't actually mentioned workloads at all. So the final step in the agent is that it's going to start listening on that workload API socket, uh, waiting for agents to start calling that workload API and say, hey, give me an identity. Who am I? Uh, that process is is also pretty much, it's a very similar to what we just went through, but just from the workload to the agent instead of from the agent to the server. So um, the workload calls the uh, workload API, which again is probably going to be local over a Unix socket uh, running on the same node. The agent's going to initiate that workload attestation uh, by calling the workload attesters, which are pluggable, which we're going to talk about a sec in a sec as well. And then those attesters are going to use various uh, kernel and user space uh, details in order to discover more and more information about that workload. And then it'll return to the agent in the form of workload selectors um, all of this information that it found. So then the agent compares the workload selectors that it's found to the uh, previously um, listed list it has of registration entries that it's authenticated in order to, uh, to issue. And assuming that there's a match, it'll find that SVID that matches all of those workload selectors and send that back to the workload. And at that point, pretty much the whole system's set up, bootstrap, ready to go. All of the workloads have everything they need in order to authenticate each other when they're calling other workloads, as well as calling workloads that are calling them. So I know I kind of whipped through that a little bit quick, but that's kind of high level how the whole thing works start to finish. Now, why do we care about it uh, with regards to Istio specifically? Um, so we take a step back when, we, when we're talking about Istio, just to kind of like dig in specifically into you know, what a workload is in this instance. Um, so I know I said workloads are platform agnostic, but I think it helps to just kind of think of a concrete instance of one. Uh, generally in Kubernetes, when we're thinking of workloads, the kind of primitives we think of are usually pods. Uh, but we actually have to drill down a little bit. And again, I think my animation is probably broken here. But uh, inside of a pod, you're going to have the service that you know, you're actually running, that your, your developers are de developing. But then you're also going to have the Istio sidecar running alongside it. Uh, as a container in the same pod. And then if you zoom in even further on that sidecar, you're going to have the Envoy proxy, and you're going to have the Istio agent. And that's important for the next step. So it's we're, we're drilling all the way down to that Envoy proxy Istio agent to kind of think about how this identity bootstrapping flow works. So this is how it works in Istio. And this is before we even touch Spire. This is just the, the default out of the box Istio kind of spiffy identification. So um, Envoy proxy is going to or first of all, the Istio agent is going to start up what's called an SDS server, or a secret discovery service. And this is basically a kind of API that Envoy knows how to talk to over gRPC in order to request all the certificates it needs to do MTLS with all of your other workloads. Uh, as soon as uh, Istio agent starts up, it's going to send a CSR, or a certificate signing request to Istio D, which will sign it using the certificate authority and send it back. And then uh, Istio is pretty much good to go with identity from there forward. So you might be asking yourself, if Istio already has this out of the box, why would I use Spire, right? I already have identity. I already get all the benefits of MTLS. Like, why do I need Spire? Um, so there's a bunch of benefits. These are just like the top three that you know I think are important, but there's a, there's a lot more than this. Um, I mentioned earlier there's a pluggable attestation. So if you think of our agent and our Spire, our, the agent and the server diagrams that we had earlier, those attesters are you know follow this plugin pattern. So you can write your own various vendors kind of publish these. So you can you can specify all of the different things that you want to base your identity on. So in AWS, it might be an instance ID, or you might have a region, or it might be a specific account. And you can kind of go into any level of detail because you can write your own. So anything that you can get in code, you can make part of the identity. And then multi-factor attestation is kind of an extension of that. And you know, there's no limit to the number of attesters you can have for a specific identity. And the more you have, assuming that they're all securely verifiable, the more kind of secure your identity is going to be. And then finally, federation. You can get like really crazy with Spire stuff. You can do multiple servers, multiple trust domains. You can do tiered um, identity servers. I'm not going to get too much into that, but it's, it's, it's a lot flexible when you start getting into the kind of more advanced use cases than uh, Istio's out of the box stuff. Uh, so how does this work uh, with Istio? So by default, um, Istio agent is just going to start up and start listening to that. The Istio agent will start up the SDS server, and Envoy will talk to that. Uh, but in Istio 114 or newer, it's going to start up. And on, on startup of the Istio agent, it actually checks for a um, known binding on a socket path. 
Um, and as of 114 or newer, if there's a binding on that, it's going to actually skip that default flow that we just went through and instead issue an SDS connection over that, um, that Linux socket. And if you've done everything right, the other side of that Linux socket is going to be our Spire agent. So what that looks like when you deploy it is something like this. Um, so this is a little bit small, I guess, but basically we've just got a Kubernetes setup here with a very bare bones cluster, but we've got two nodes, a couple of workloads in each one. And you can see our agent is deployed as a daemon set. Um, daemon set is the perfect kind of Kubernetes uh, deployment model for this because we want one agent running on every single node because there's node specific properties that each one needs to know about. And then we've got our server, which in this case is gonna be running as a stateful set. Uh, and I mentioned registry a few times as well. So in Kubernetes, we can run this Kubernetes workload registrar as part of the, the Spire server pod. And that, that's basically gonna auto register any new workloads that are kind of uh, bootstrapped into our Kubernetes cluster. Um, now this gets interesting when say you want some more advanced deployment patterns. So Kubernetes, not so bad, but say what happens if you want to onboard a VM into your mesh. So uh, onboarding your VM into the mesh is has quite a few different steps, but generally the the way we like to do it, at least in Istio, is to install an Istio agent process in the VM alongside the app. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, this actually looks quite like the uh, Istio, like a pod in Kubernetes, right? You've got your app, you've got your sidecar. And the nice thing is it's logically very similar. So you can actually just drop a Spire agent in there, point it back at the Spire server, and then this VM's app is going to have everything it needs in order to both um, authenticate the identity of any of the services running in the cluster, but also vice versa. All of the cluster services are going to be able to authenticate the identity of the app that's running in the VM. So this is this is really powerful. Um, and just kind of another point that we kind of mentioned a few times, but all of this Spire stuff is pretty platform agnostic. So there, there's no reason that the Spire server needs to run in Kubernetes, right? You could put this somewhere else, some central identity server. Um, doesn't have to be cloud. It could be on-premises. It could be some legacy system that just is in charge of identity for whatever reason. Um, and again, you can you can point to this from pretty much anything that you've got a client that's able to talk to it on. So you can grow your architecture, add more VMs, add more clusters, add more cloud providers. Um, you know, at a certain scale, you have to start tweaking the deployment a little bit, but that's a whole other talk. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much the the whirlwind tour. I, I did have a, a demo, but I don't trust the Wi-Fi too much to do it. Uh, so here's a list of resources uh, that are basically helpful if you want to learn more about Spiffy. Spire, uh, CERT management in general, Istio's implementation specifically. Uh, all these slides should be available on our website afterwards as well. Um, and also we're hiring. So if any of this stuff sounds interesting or anything else you've heard from solo folks today, um, you know, come find anyone with the little gluey guy in our shirts or come uh, check us out on our website. Uh, we're headquartered in Boston, but we do hire uh, remote. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Yeah.